Okay, so this presentation is about sharing what I have learned working in an agile environment and working iteratively. And it happens to be within an enterprise software company, but it actually applies to anybody who wants what's best for their customers and wants to learn how to experiment with uh, UX integration with other functional teams. So this is the story for today. Alex, who? Um, a brief history of data storage UX. I just want to put it in context so you understand. Uh, the Cumula way, how it's made. Everybody wants to know how UX sausage is made. The cross-functional team, integration, and if there's any time left, I'd love to do some Q&A. So, who's Alex? This is actually a picture of me, I, a selfie of myself about a month ago when I went to a customer site and helped with the install. I actually put in all those disks well, and then injured my elbow. Um, <laughs> I actually started working as a designer when the standard uh, resolution for screening was 640 by 480. Who remembers that? Yeah, right? And it was also 256 colors only. So when I look at my experiences, that gain, uh, it's, uh, they're gaining three phases. The very first phase is what I call the storytelling phase. It's also called the golden ages of macromedia flash. <laughs> Remember those days? <laughs> so I actually learned uh, to tell, uh, to do storytelling um, with different kinds of stories, whether it's a sports story, whether it's a human type of story, or just news in general. And it's all about people trying to figure out how to monetize from the content with advertising. So there was a lot of, in terms of UX wise, there was a lot of like, mm, the ad needs to be above the fold, all that stuff. So the UX suffered a little bit, but people were still trying to figure out how to do that well. The second phase is what I call the Web 2.0, the beginning of the Web 2.0. I was the first design hire at Zillow. Again, people are now still trying to figure out how to monetize. It's now, it's, uh, they're like, I remember people were talking about having anti-search words because People were contributing, and and sometimes we're talking about something that bad that happened, like a car accident that happened. Then there's like a it's a Prius that was in a car accident, and then on the side there's a Prius advertisement. So the people were still trying to figure out how to monetize without hurting their brand. And I kind of got really tired of dealing with advertising, and not just me personally. I decided to jump headfirst right into enterprise. So I went over to AWS Marketplace first, and then moved over to Amazon Web Services. Well. AWS Marketplace is actually owned by AWS. Marketplace is actually owned by AWS. And I realized that there is this huge untapped resource for like, not resource, but like opportunities for UX people because enterprise users were just not being taken care of. There's just a huge lack of empathy. And the reason why I'm here today is because Cumulo, all the companies I have worked at, is the only company that actually encourages every single person to talk to the customers, especially UX people. So I'm actually on first name basis with every single one of our customers, and I talk to them pretty much every day. Not, not the same person, but like I rotate <coughs> talk to them. So what is Cumulo? Well, Cumulo is an enterprise data storage company that's here in Seattle, actually about one block away. It's founded in 2012. Um, I was employee number 25, and now I'm 170 and growing. We are not cloud, even though the name Cumulo sounds like Cumulus Cloud. We're actually not cloud, we're on-premises. We're currently targeting uh, media entertainment, life sciences, and oil and gas. So people with a lot of storage needs on site. Because using the cloud they, to, churn, uh, to calculate all this data, you can't do it over the cloud really fast, and it costs a lot of money to do so over the cloud. So they still need on-premises data storage. Uh, the intellectual property is only in software, and we have commodity, commodity hardware that we qualify. So our IP is all in the software. That's where we work uh, the hardest at. I'm not here today to sell you anything about Cumulo, but I will be talking a lot about Cumulo because there are all these UX things I feel like we're doing right that I've never experienced anywhere else before, and I think that it's actually possible to make it happen. So I just want to hope share my story and inspire you guys a little bit to maybe take it back and experiment in your companies. This is a quote from our customer. It almost makes me suspicious how easy this is to use. I'm very impressed. So the way we earn customer feedback like this is working in a way that I'm about to share with you. But first, let's put things in context. Let's talk about the new experience around dealing with all the data since the early 2000s. In the year 2000, 
Are you guys Pony and fans? <laughs> okay. For the low starting price of $150,000, we will sacrifice to bring you the knowledge of command line. The knowledge will help you teach your $150,000 storage how to do tricks. Good luck! So this is what you get. And this is the interface we get. You guys remember command line? Has anybody actually used command line? Okay. It's, it's difficult. And this is a tool that they use to manage their storage systems. By the mid-2000, the very first Decent web UI where it was introduced. This is from a local company called Isilon, who actually one of the biggest storage companies in the world. Um, this is 2000. They still don't really know how to use uh, this space correctly. And what's also yeah. lacking is actual understanding user workflow. So you actually still have to hit uh, uh, hunt and pick for the right functionality. By the early 2010s, there are now these really Amazing user experience <laughs> videos that you can find on YouTube. I watch this video about four times. I don't understand it. I still don't understand it because not only do you need to have enterprise data sort of knowledge, like expert level knowledge, you still need to uh, remember where all the gems are hidden in those web UI. So nobody's really taking consideration of how people actually naturally work or how they think through a process. So this is still a choice by 2010s. Um, this also makes it really difficult for small to mid-sized companies to adopt enterprise data storage because they, it costs a lot of money to get into the system and it actually takes a lot of training to learn how to manage the system. And small to mid-sized companies, they don't have the money to have a full-time person to do that job. So they're kind of stuck. So there's also people who have needs are unmet. So what does this tell you about the UX of enterprise data storage? product and services in general. It blows donkey chunk, right? It blows. <laughs> so with that UX problem, you're also dealing with ever-growing data. So this is, actually 20, uh, this is from 2014. So if you look at 2014, looking back, 10% of, uh, of the data in the world was created before 2011. The rest of it is after that. That's crazy, right? It's the world, the data of the world is actually growing at an exponential rate, doubling every two years. So for, in 2015, for every minute of every day, some of you are sending questionable photos to each other. <laughs> yeah? Some of you are teaching people how to braid your hair or do something really, really cool on YouTube. 300 hours of it per minute. And some of you are swiping. Rejecting people. We're accepting people. We're taking a giant risk. But this is like so much data. So nobody wants to be responsible for throwing away any data, and no one wants to get ever gets to get promoted for getting rid of data. We're all trained and encouraged to create data and to keep everything. Every single one of us in this room are all data pack rats. Right? <laughs> The big squeeze. <laughs> so this is what we call the big squeeze. The data of the world is growing at a rate of 40% of 40 annually, while budget for data storage is only growing 2 to 3% annually. And the price per terabyte is only dropping by 40 to 50%. Does anybody know what comes out of terabyte? Petabyte. Okay, what comes out of petabyte? Exabyte. Exabyte, what comes out of exabyte? Zetabyte. So for the world right now, we are, we're looking at Zetabyte. Do you guys know what comes out of Zetabyte? It's the last unit. Yottabyte. Y-O-T-T-A, I, I, I thought it was Yoda. <laughs> I'm on Earth, sorry. <laughs> so really, does anybody know what's inside the boxes? No one knows. Have you worked in a big company where you're, you're asked to save your data on the, like a server, a share server, and sometimes you're trying to save, it's really super slow, and you like file a ticket, you can make a complaint to the admin. You know what, they have no fucking clue. Oh, sorry. They have no clue, and it's not their fault. They have no clue as to why it's slow. And sometimes you come to work and like, oh, this, this actually happened one time at AWS. I came to work one day and like the entire design folder disappeared. And it's all shared because somebody actually dragged it to somewhere else. So it's not gone, but nobody knows where it is. <laughs> yeah, there's zero insight on this. 
So this is what's happening, really. Just like the radio the last hour. You find this awesome treasure, you put it in a storage box, see ya, it's gone. So storage admins have no ability to get insights on how their storage is used, and they don't know how to plan for the future, so they don't know how to justify the budget at all. So the general storage industry practice is this. And this is from conducting more than 600 plus user interviews before we even ship the product. What the users want, they want to buy less to save money. What the business want, they want to sell more to make money. Users want to be empowered. Business wants to sell more support. We don't want to empower you. We want to make more money. Users want to know how storage is being used. Nah, don't worry about it. Just buy more. Who cares? Just pile it in. Users have already spent millions. But yeah, but your data is growing, so you kind of need to spend more. Sorry to tell you. We can't easily use another storage solution. Well, good. Keep buying our stuff. It's great, right? The more you suffer, the more it shows you really care, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what we've actually basically discovered that there's zero user empathy. It's a business model that only benefits the businesses. Customers feel powerless and they're stuck with no better solutions in sight. So here comes Kibula, 2012, tiny little company was formed, and our very first value, company value, and it's shared across every single person believing this, that our customers are our magnetic field. Everything we build is driven by the challenges and designed around their needs. So we actually spend 50% of our time doing research before we actually spend the other half the time doing design and iteration and testing. We really, really understand what the problems are to figure out what the insights are. Here's another quote. The management UI doesn't look like a storage product, which is a huge compliment. So in order to have feedback like this, you need to have a good representation of users and technology. Because when a startup only understands technology, it inevitably invents things with no compelling use. So you got your VP of product that talks about what the users want, and the VP of engineering that talks about what might be doable with technology. You're having an argument by proxy. Users, desires versus technology. If you don't have a strong voice of customers, which is your UX and your product people, then technology will win the argument every single time. And you'll never end up with an easy to use, let alone desirable product. Is this true? So from that, we have our product vision from, set forth by our VP of products, Jeff Kopp. You have to be led by what delights the customers, not what minimally satisfies them. And as I talked about earlier, the bar is so low, right? So low. We don't just want to be a little bit better. We can, we can kick their butt pretty much by just, just do a little bit better. But we want to be here. We want to turn our users into the new hero of his or her company. So we design the UX actually from the ground up not just in terms of software itself, everything about storage, everything about our business. The old way is, hey, where did the business help you manage your storage? Cumulo's way is, where did the business help you manage your data? Storage is your safe. Data is your money. Safe companies will talk about how great their safe is. They're going to tell you about how, hey, it's not going to explode and you drop a nuclear rocket on it. But the thing is, what you really care about is what's, what's the money doing inside of it. Is it, is it making you more money? Is it, is it shrinking? What's happening? Who's accessing that money? The old way is there's no insights. That's actually delayed. If you want to actually buy insights, you actually have to spend like at least $200,000 for the add-on software to get more insights. And that insights is not instant. It's usually at least 24 hours before you can kind of see anything that's happening. We decided to build our insights into the product. There's zero check-in once you buy, which is the old way. The cumulative way is that we set up a, a call with you every two weeks. We hop on call. So I, we are we're shared a calendar across the company. So any, anytime anybody has a question about a certain thing, just go to that call and just ask them a question. Software updates typically is 20, uh, 12 to 18 months being shipped if you're lucky. We've heard a lot of customers talk about how they've been complaining about those features lacking or there's a bug. They never actually get any help. A lot of them just are sad. So what we're doing things differently is that we decided to ship software updates every two weeks. We built our product in small incremental pieces in a way that ensures software is always shippable. And we need a little quality 
in small increments and as soon as ready. So we are actually very responsive to our customer needs and it ultimately it's about what's best for customers and what drives the innovation that they're looking for in storage. So who's working in a big company or a company that says they're agile? If you're UX people, do you feel actually integrated in the agile process? No. no. So my experience with that is like, hey, we're agile, cool, come to our stand cool, don't say anything because you're a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to it and I just, okay, I'm here every day, yay, great, FaceTime, great. And the UX team still does the waterfall, right? So this still happens, you have this invisible wall of, invisible wall of unnecessary divide, this happens. The UX team still goes back to waterfall. They still work on this giant feature. They take a lot of time and effort into it, and it's actually really, really, really fucking good, right? But once they're done, they toss it over the wall. They're like, oh my god. Please let them build what I designed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have so many projects that I've worked on over the years that I'm so proud of, but when they shipped, I'm like, oh god, I'm like, because I'm not going to build it. <laughs> right? That's happened. So it's because people don't take the time to figure out how to really integrate UX people with the engineer, with engineers, they, they don't. So this is what we do at Cumulo. Our product manager um, does a really great job um, taking, taking in like business and technology and users' needs and really balance it out and help us prioritize what we're gonna be working on next. So their job is helping us figure out priority. Our individual job functions, UX people engineers, is we figure out how to actually achieve it and make it happen. So they set the priority, we do it. We, we figure out how best to do it. So at any time, there's more than one story in flight. So UX people work on UX story, engineers work on engineering story. We're always talking to each other. We're getting feedback back and forth all the time to really understand um, if, you know, if, if the thing I'm working on is actually technology, te technically feasible, and if technology story is actually going to be lovable. And the product manager also does a, uh, does a really great job helping prioritize projects so that we work on one small UX feature or improvements that can be shipped every release, which is two weeks. And we also work on small pieces that are after the big features. So every two weeks, the customers feel and see something in the product that they desire, that, that they want. So what we ship may be tiny, but it's bulletproof, ready to ship, and lovable. We keep adding to it until it is full, fully featured. Therefore, every time we ship something, our customers can benefit, they can see the progress, we get immediate feedback, how to, uh, how to make it better, and because the customers see the benefits, they actually want to stay up to date, which helps makes it, uh, this, keep the support costs down. It's actually winning for everyone. And if you don't know anything about enterprise data storage, it, they have to schedule it like months ahead on when they actually do the software update because a lot of times what really sucks about this for them is that when they do the software upgrade, they think everything's great and it takes like hours and hours, sometimes two days to do this because they have to migrate the data off, do the upgrade, migrate the data back, and then when they turn it back on, it doesn't turn on. This has happened, like people have lost millions and billions of dollars of data. So for them to actually want to do this every two weeks, it really says a lot about what we're shipping to them, that they actually can see the value. Have you guys seen this before? So this is the waterfall, or the people who pretend to be, who say they're agile, but they still have these really long release cycles, right? If even by this time, maybe by the end of time, you actually might find out it's not a car that they want. Maybe it's actually a bus that they want, right? Don't know. But if you do things iteratively, you know they need to go from point A to point B. You're like, okay, maybe the solution's a car, we don't really know, but you know what we can do? We can give you a small skateboard, help you kind of test it out, see what, what you like about it. And they come back to us and say, you know what? Skateboard, yeah, I can go a little bit from here to there, but if you give me a little handlebar, I can go a little even further. So we learn from talking to them. And then after they're like, hey, you know what? I want to sit, my leg's getting tired. So okay, let's build a bicycle. We're like, hey, this is pretty cool, pretty cool. But if you know what, if my legs are getting tired, what, can you, can you add an engine to this? We're like, yeah, we can do that. And so this is not to be meant taken literally because this is actually very different than this. But you know what I'm saying, right? You, you, you ship little small stuff, you learn from it, and you build up to it. 
it's, it's a great way to continuously improve your product. So here's an example of what, how we've broken down a big V1 feature into smaller pieces. This is a feature, a V1 feature, what we call capacity history. What happens up here is basically, um, this is a time frame, this is a period time frame. Uh, what we're looking at is last 72 hours. The purple line gives you the history, and the, the bars going up and down gives you the delta with what actually changed during that time. If you click on one of these, below here will give you the details like, oh, these are the different file paths that changed during that time. So this is meant to help with storage planning, justify budget, where did my space data go, and who's taking up the room, right? So our very first release with just an API, we get the top half API out there um, so people can use it because we found out that a lot of data admins, they still like to use like uh, products like Splunk. I don't know if you have a Splunk, but it's basically a dash, da dashboard tool to suck in data and visualize it so they can use that. So the first, and then the second release, is the line. Only 72 hours. And the reason why we picked 72 hours is because we heard over and over again people say, hey, I come back on the weekend, and before I left, we had you know 80% storage empty. And I came back to work on Monday, all of it is gone. What happened to it? So that's why we settled on 72 hours. So the third release is we added the drop down so we can switch between 72 hours, last 30 days, and last 52 weeks. And then we also added these bars, the deltas. And then the fourth release, we added this, the hover bubble, which gave you more information about what's happening there. The fifth release is the API for the lower half of the tool. And the sixth release, which we're actually still currently working on, this is actually taking about three months to work on, it's super hard. So the next release will be this. And what we, what, we, what we were able to learn while building this and shipping this iteratively is that the word history gave users the impression that the data is exactly what it is, even though what we're actually trying to show is trends using aggregated data. We were able to learn lots from our iterative process and we have renamed this to capacity trends. So we didn't actually get to iterating UX like this from the start. I actually had a really hard time with this because I'm always like always waterfall. So it's like, hey, as a you know, as a UX person, I wanna I wanna design something that's just fucking amazing, oh. right? So I had to actually learn how to break that into smaller pieces. So UX and Cumulo is all these things. We do user research, software, uh, UI, UX the unboxing experience, the installation experience, so I get to go on installations. We do hardware and lighting, like how to use a light on the hardware to tell people what's happening with their storage. Um, we do small marketing stuff, and generally just visual design, hardware diagrams, visio diagrams, support illustrations. So this is, this is what UX mean in, in, in our world, in Cumulo. Uh, we talk directly with users and customers, we work with hardware, operations, engineers, certification, customer success, marketing, sales, et cetera. Et cetera. So anybody who has any UX needs, they come to my team and talk to us. So in other companies, sales team may feel like they own the relationship with customers. I don't know if that's true for your companies, but that's typically true in a lot of companies. But at Cumulo, we are all very much encouraged to get to know the customers by first name and reach out to them directly. Our customers are actually very giddy when I, when I call them or email them because they know that if I talk to them or they talk to me, that they're gonna see something awesome coming soon that they will benefit. So we have this really cool relationship set up and I encourage you to, if you can, start talking with your customers and make friends with them. And so let's talk about our process. I'm just simplifying this into four step process. So the very first step is learn and share. So like I said before, we spent about 50% of our time on the project on research. So we will go out there and we we'll schedule as many customer and user interviews as we can within a set amount of time, usually about two weeks. And because our user base is tiny, if we're wildly successful, like, you know, Alex, we IPO and you're, you're a millionaire, yay, um, maybe a thousand people will ever have seen the designs that me and my team have generated. So we have a tiny, small user base. So about five to 10 users actually gives a really good sample to, of understanding what their needs are, what their pain points are. 
And then once we've learned that, we get in a room with the team, with our sprint team, which is engineers, product owners, and the UX people. We share with one another one about what we've learned. What's really great about this is the engineers actually takes the time to explain the really hard, difficult technologies to us, like the existing solutions, biotechnology, so, and we have the um, ability to ask lots of questions so we really understand what, you know, what snapshot is, what replication means, all these, all these really hard technologies. And then on, the other, on the, um, the other side of it is that now the UX people and the product people now share back to the engineers what the users want, what, what, what their pain points are, what their wishes are, what their desires are. And then at this time, product manager take all this data, they come up with a feature roadmap by breaking down the features into smaller pieces. And the very first piece is the MEP which is a minimal viable product. And this very process is actually intended for conversation. It's not like, oh, this is the way it is, how to ship it this way. It's just a starting point. So once we get the prioritization, like, okay, this is a project we need to work on, we do, we, this is the way we do the, uh, the bulk of the actual UX work, you know, from information architecture to UX flows, to wireframes, prototype. We're constantly reviewing our work with our stakeholder, which is my engineers, my PMs, um, Sometimes marketing, if they're involved with hardware people, and our UX tests are UX tests use clickable prototypes that looks exactly like the product, but no code is written. We use Axure Accumulo and check it out if you haven't heard of it. A X U R E, it's really awesome. You can be as hi-fi or low-fi as you want it to be, and then we share and incorporate findings. And this is when the UX people checks that MVP meets the bar for an LP. Does anybody know what MLP is? Minimum lovable product. So if you haven't heard of that, here's a, the definition of MVP from uh, my product manager. What we want to ship is something our users will use and can get some value out of it. A balance of good first release with effort spent. MLP validates that you want what you want to ship will create happy customers. We make sure to also be set with emotion and bring the light if possible. So Put it in context. I have a four-year-old. She started a brand new, pre uh, pr brand new school that required us to make lunch, make lunch for her. The, the other school provided lunch. So this school, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how to make her lunch. So I used to make lunches like this: a sandwich, some sort of fruit, some sort of pizza or something, right? Two weeks later, it's like every single day she would bring home pretty much the whole lunch, maybe one bite out of it. She's just not eating. I'm like, oh no, my kid is failing to thrive. That's, okay, that's a doctor's term. But, <laughs> but so, so I'm like, oh, what do I do, what do I do? So I spent a little time, made it lovable. Made the sandwich into a little dinosaurs and little hearts, cut out a little love. Okay, this takes five minutes, this takes about 10. So I put a little bit more effort in. So she started eating her lunches and she was like bragging about it. So every morning she's like, hey mom, come on. What does my lunch look like? <laughs> so this is this is the minimum viable product. This is the lovable. I actually made it so that she actually wants to use it. She loves it. She brags about it. So that's the difference between the two. And Accumulo, sometimes it takes up to six months plus before the engineers will be able to work on the solution that has been designed. So we, we decided not to spec it right away. So we have learned that it's best to delay that work until at least one or two sprints prior to when the engineers plan on building the design. So for projects that have a long waiting period, this gives us a really good opportunity to make sure that the solution that we designed way back then is still relevant. Are there any new information that we found out about the customers since then? Can we incorporate new findings in here? Can we make this even more, more kick-ass, right? And then the last step, you want to be in the trenches with the engineers. Make it so. So this, this is when the engineer starts coding. They refer to the UX specs, and they code, and then test, and then repeat. And because they're actually able to access a real database and like putting real data, they'll actually find out about a lot of use cases we have never seen. So we sit right next to them, we work with them, we talk with them like, so hey Alex, this UX, this, this, this use case is missing, you know, we need to figure out how to do this. Like, okay, let's chat about it, what do you think? Okay, back and forth, back and forth. I'll design something, I'll show them a wire, and like, yeah, this works. So we just work there right next to each other. And what's really great about this is that engineers, they feel like they're part of it. They contribute it to you. And one of the things that I tell my entire company is that, hey, guess what? I am so lucky to be here because I get to 
help design what the UX is, but all of you, every single one of you, actually make the UX happen. So they know that UX is a shared responsibility. It's not just the UX team's responsibility. So make that clear to them that, hey, we need you. Okay? You, need, you need us, but we need you more. So they, they will be a part of uh, your, your allies. Um, so yeah, so we will design and pull it back in the spec. So this is the last step. And so if you look at the big picture of our process flow today, we basically do all these research. It's all about research right here. Um, our feedback, our data comes from all these different people, different type of functional groups. And then the PO, product owner, will prioritize projects. And then we do the deep dive. We share the findings. And then they do the product roadmap. And then we do the design and build. Test, a lot of iterations, a lot of back and forth, just talking, 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 talking. Woo! A lot of talking. Um, and then it goes back here again. This is basically our process. But we didn't get there from just day one. We actually did a lot of UX and engineering experiments. How do we integrate? We apply the scientific method to how we can work better together. So, does anybody know Scrum versus Kanban? Do you know the difference, kind of? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna talk about just a little bit of this. So, Scrum. The change agent is that you forecast a certain amount of work, story points being done with a fixed time interval. So, I don't know if you see engineering do the point system, like, oh, son, okay, I will work on eight points the next sprint, and I'll get it done. So, they do that, right? Release cycle, they can, uh, releases can occur continuously, most often when there is user value created. I think in some big companies, they actually don't do releases very often. And, and Cumulus is the most frequent release cycle I've ever been at, two weeks. I think at AWS was like a long time, I don't know. At least on AWS Marketplace, I remember it was like a year and a half. <laughs> it's a long time. And then uh, rituals, the daily stand-ups, reviews, retrospectives, groomings. Um, and then the team member roles, team members have no, spe uh, no speciality roles. Ideally, anyone can work on any task, so you can pull any card off, right? So this is actually really bad for UX and engineering, the same thing, because ideally, I'm supposed to go up and go, oh yeah, I'm gonna work on this API stuff. No, I can't, because I am not a full stack engineer. So that philosophy doesn't really apply, and what's really difficult is that sometimes you might have a Scrum Master who is really about, hey, this is the Agile way, do it this way they don't respect that there are more, more than one discipline, different process within that. So, Kanban, um, the change agents that work amount is determined by our team capacity. Tasks are pulled from prioritized backlog. This is a continuous workflow. There's a work in progress limit. So, for my UX team right now, we each have a two work in progress limit. You can only work on one long-term project and one short-term project at a time. Um, this is really like the same as Scrum and rituals and meetings. So it's emphasis on continuous planning. So you gotta keep the planning so there's always something in the backlog you can pull from. And then team member roles, they can be specialized or cross-functional, just depending on your company. And this is our flavor of UX Kanban. So for this part of it, it's the same as this Kanban. Uh, our release cycles is that we work with product UX engineering, we work together to ship like every two weeks. And then our rituals, we utilize retrospectives because I think it's important to talk about what went well and what didn't, what, what didn't go well. That's being scientific. And daily stand-ups and grooming. Want to make sure that the, the stories you have, you know what the acceptance criteria are. Otherwise, how do you know the story is done, right? right? Um, and this also helps us being transparent and be aligned with the Scrum UI engineering team. And the, and the team members can specialize and pull tasks related to their area of expertise. However, too much will reduce the team's effectiveness. However, we haven't found that yet, so you know, I'm just like, I don't know. Um, so the first um, experiment we did is what I call a reactive UX, Scrum. The goal, get all the work assigned to this team done. Just any work, all work. Um, it's made up of two UX designers, one visualization lead, and then I just want to call out the visualization lead. This person is actually kind of a hybrid 
between the engineering person and the UX person, he's really good at looking at data analytics and he can like hack code to kind of figure out how to suck data out of systems. And then he's really good at figuring out what visualization to use to show off that data, to tell the story. Uh, we have four to six back end devs and one to four front end devs. The reason why this changes is because at that time, Cumulo firm, firmly believed in rotating engineers to different teams so they can be more aware of what's going on and be more experienced in all areas. Always one product manager and one scrum master. So the pros of this is that we work really closely. We became really good friends with one another. Friends and friends work well together, by the way. Uh, constant collaboration, which has meant a lot of iteration and feedback loops. The cons is that engineers rotate in and out of the scrum team. How many people do you know that are engineers that are not UI engineers, that are made to do UI work, doesn't really like it? So many, right? So the people that got rotating that who weren't focused on UI, they actually didn't do a very good job. They just want to get it done, get it out of the way. So the quality kind of dropped quite a bit. UX also had no, little visibility into the future projects further on to Spinch, which meant that it did not allow a lot of time to test before code and also not a lot of time, not a lot of time to actually do a lot of research. So like I call bullshit on this and we switched to the new world, which is what I call the UX island. <laughs> The goal is to get all the short-term and long-term UX projects done. UX is the low, mm, no engineers. The pro, though, is that UX controlled its own timeline and backlog. That's great, and we were still breaking things down iteratively. We were not doing waterfall. Um, we complete UX projects. A oh, complex UX project's got six to 12 months heads up. That's a, that's a lot of time, which was great to do research and test iterations. We're lonely. <laughs> we were very lonely. There's reduced collaboration between UX and dev, so when our project was done, all the engineers were assigned to different teams, so they were, they were busy, so there's no time to focus on any UX projects. So we actually created this little <coughs> purgatory category <laughs> on our own board, which is, it's done, purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> so that was very sad. So, the company recognized, wow, the UX team's actually doing a really great job of research and coming up with this awesome design, but what? We're not, we're not shipping any of it. Okay, let's, let's switch things around again. What, what can we do? So we created a mission-specific team. No longer our goal, it's our real mission now. Let's delight our users with the best UX possible. We brought the band back together, basically. <laughs> we got the UX team, we added a researcher, yay. Um, we, uh, we have three dedicated front-end devs. These guys love UI. They love it, love it, love it. And what's really great about it is that when I now go to a different team, like back-end team, to talk to them about whatever project that I might need back-end support, they can't BS me, because they know that I got UI people, engineers, that knows what they're talking about. So it gives me more clout. So even if I go there by myself, they know, oh, oh Alex is part of that team. You know, Oh, yeah, let's, let's talk frankly. But people at Cumulo are pretty nice, they don't BS anymore anyway. But it feels like, it just makes me feel like, wow, they list, really listen to us. They give us the time of the day. And the pro of this is constant collaboration. We're always talking to each other, we're having lunch together, we're going to parties together, we're going to AC and DC concerts together. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, constant feedback loops. We're, um, UX is working off the team backlog and the UX backlog. Because what we learned from the previous experiments that if we just work off the team backlog, there are all these UX projects that gets ignored. For example, creating personas. For example, really go understand this one technology or whatever. For example, go to installs to learn what the customers feel when they do installations. So it's good to have two backlogs. The, the, which also gave us ample time for all types of UX research and projects. But I think this is also from the leftover from doing the previous experiment where no projects was getting actually implemented. So this is why I gave us a whole bunch of leeway. The con is that to drive the product changes, we need to coordinate with other expert teams since we don't have any backend experts. So we're still like, hey, hey guys, we really need this thing. We, we, need, we, we wanna build this like capacity history thing. And for us to do so, we need your support with data at the backend. They're like, we don't have time. Oh no, so, so that is still a part we're trying to figure out. So we have four different workflows. 
we got a UX designer workflow, we got a UX researcher workflow, we got a visualization person workflow, and we got an engineering workflow. Four workflows, but only one process that is being respected. So that is not good, right? So it ended up adding a lot of overhead for UX people. Not good. So we just switched over to this fourth one, optimize, optimize process, Kanban and Scrum. So the engineering team, they went back to the, the Scrum, the UX team is now Kanban. We split into two sub-teams. The mission is to delight our users with the best UX possible and optimize for people over process. So, UX team, sub-team, for, now we have four front-end devs and then served by the same product owner and a scrum master. The pros of this is all the pros from the last experiment, UX and engineering can focus on optimizing its processes. This is really good news. Um, Sub-teams still, still get together to work on optimizing the team process. So when we get together, the time is not wasted. Not half the team just standing there like zoning, like you know, spacing out. When we get together, we actually talk about, hey, how can we work better? How can I deliver better specs? How can you communicate better to me? What kind of research um, data do you need from us? You know, it's a lot more collaborative. The con is that we still need to coordinate with other expertise on projects that, that needs back and support. But right now, what we're trying to do is we're setting ourselves up as a service team. So that all these back end teams, uh, for example, if they're working on this thing called erasure coding, they still actually have a UX component to it. That component will come to my team. We'll work on it together, and then we'll partner up, and then make them together. Um, and the con is that it's too new to know yet, because we just started this in January, because back in the day, we were like, ah, this is not working. So this is new, so feel free to pay me, and ask me in a couple of months how this is working. I'd be happy to share with you. OK, guys, that was way too easy. Turn it on, give it a name, and click OK. I'll be out of a job in no time. This is our from our, our search admins who love us. This is the closest thing to an Apple product in the storage world. <laughs> I think I need a mic drop that day. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy. But then I came back and said, no, no, everybody, it's all, it's, it's all you, everybody. We all did this together. Remember, to give credit to everybody because they helped you. It's not just you. It's all of them, right? So from doing all of this, what do we get? As of December of 2015, which garnered a score of 89.6 SUS score. So do you know what a SUS score is, anybody? Um, it's a system usability scale. It's a 10 item questionnaire administered to users for measuring the perceived ease of use of software, hardware, cell phones, and websites. It's been around for more than a quarter of a century. And just for context, anything over 70 is actually considered excellent. And the average product SUS is about 68. So I'm pretty happy about the score. And we're continuing to take the scores just to make sure we can start benching, benchmark ourselves. Questions? <laughs> okay, Alvin. Um, you mentioned that you are working on off of two backlogs. One is the product backlog and the, the, the other one is the UX backlog. Who decides which backlog is the priority for the current team? I work closely with the product owner of our, of our team to, to work on that. I will tell them like, hey, I think from the UX backlog, I think this thing where like, we really need to understand this persona. We need to work on this. He'll go, okay, let's balance it out with this thing that we want to ship in two weeks. So we actually work together on that. It's not like him only, it's me helping out. It's, a, it's usually a conversation. Before January, how long did you try the other? Uh, oh, okay, yeah, let's go back to that. So this one was about a year. This is, and then this one, this one's six months. This is pretty painful, so six months ago, I'm like, I got it up, ah, I miss my peeps. And then this is also six, uh, this is about a year. Yeah, just about a year and a half. And then this is where we are. So to get visibility into what, what the other people on in, in the band are doing, so their backlog, like just to make sure, like the project manager or product manager is making sure that, like all the backlogs are working. But how do you have visibility into making sure that like oh that person said they were going to be working on this or that's in their backlog? Oh like, yeah, we, we have state so we have the babies stand ups. Stand -ups. Okay. I go to theirs, they come to mine. Okay. It's it's an open door policy. You can show up anytime you want. But we we 
because we sit next to each other, and, and actually we, we wrote it into our working agreement that the US people have to sit with the UI engineers. So, and we're looking at expanding right now, so there, there might be a possibility with split us up. We're like, no, our working agreement is that we have to sit with one another. Yeah, so we're always talking with one another. So even if I'm not working on whatever they're working on, they're always asking me, like, hey, Alex, we just discovered this thing. Or, hey, Alex, there's a use case that's not, that's not designed. So I know exactly what they're working on. And same thing from me. From my end, I'm like, oh, I just discovered this. Hey, what does this technology mean? Can you explain it to me? So we're always constantly talking to each other so we know exactly what we're always each other's working on. Yeah. Back there. Yes. I think for most of us who are in this room, um, because enterprises in the title, we work for big, huge companies where that sponsorship, that executive um, vision of UX being something that matters. You know, we, you had you had the timeline, you know, the history of UX. Most of us are still way the hell back there um, using using the command line, and the, and the UV is just an afterthought. So, do you have? Any advice for those of us who are trying to make just incremental little yes. changes? What do we do? I, I think I think you know I look at I look back at all the places I've worked at. This is the only place that actually encourages every single one of us to become friends with everybody. Okay? I remember a big company I used to work at, it was shown upon a mash took a lunch. Everybody typically ate at their desks even the UX people, right? That is not okay because in order for people to actually want to help each other, they actually need to be friends or friendly with one another. So at our company, we're growing. I was, you know, like I said, I was 25 and now we're 170-ish. We're actually encouraged to make friends with one another all the time. There's like functions, we, we have a great cafeteria, they have, they brought in a panini station. But even if you don't have that in your company, what you need to do is seek out a, a friend in the engineering department, somebody who might be interested in the UI. So I actually did that at AWS Marketplace when I was working there. I went and talked to the UI person and became friends with that person. Make it a lot easier when they're implementing stuff that you know that because you're friends with them that they're not going to screw you over. Right. They want to keep that friendship. So start small by making friends with people. Yeah. I'm, I'm embedded with the front end developers, um, but it seems like we're the red headed stepchild of you know the entire company. Yeah. So just trying to make the case that UX is something that we really need to be paying attention to um, to the higher ups is we just are, are not getting a lot of traction. See if you can um, see if you can start talking to someone who might be interested in UX, maybe they don't understand it, but they might be interested, start showing them the way of UX. <laughs> get them interested, get them involved, make them feel like they're adding value. That's how you get somebody to start sponsoring you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious, like, who proposes and drives the experiments and how do they how, to, how who says let's all do this and everybody buys in or like how does it how does leadership buy in? We are all encouraged to be leaders, so we all spoke up basically because like our retros, we have weekly retros. We talk about what works, what doesn't work. It just seems like there's a common thing that keeps popping up. The last three months, we're like, oh wow, this is really shitty. Okay, let's do something about it. What, what, what should we do? Mm -hmm. And then it's actually a team decision. You know, this uh, was it the sumo. Uh, what is it? Uh, shit, shit. No, wait, that's not. Either do yes, um, I'll go with the team, or no. So we actually voted on breaking the team into two sub teams. And the reason we want to keep uh, like externally facing as one team is what I was talking about, like having clout. Like, oh, you have people mm -hmm. actually have clout because we have engineers backing us. But yeah, but it's anybody. Like, if I was dissatisfied, say, in two months from now, like because how the team is not working well, I will speak up. And then they'll probably, because we work so closely together, they probably feel it already too. They're like, yeah, 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 I agree. Let's, let's figure something out. Yes? So I'm really interested in this concept of having the two backlogs. And it seems like the role of the product owner or the product manager is really crucial there. 
have you did you have any um, issues around sort of the prioritization of like these short term quick things versus the longer term things, or what was the sort of process of getting the product owner to to care equally about the UX backlog as the feature backlog? I think um, I think at Cumulo we don't hire uh, product owners who don't care about UX. I think that's really lucky for us. But there are times when I have to say, hey, listen, I know you want you know want me and my team to dedicate time on this pro project, but without doing this UX thing, we're not going to be able to provide as much value because we're going to be lack a lot of understanding. So I just talked to them that way. They're like, all right, how, what can we do? I said, how about if I for the next sprint, we spend you know we spend two days on this. That should give us enough to, to figure out do we need to do more exploration, more research, or what. But like, give me two days to do this. They're usually pretty good about that. Yeah, okay, I can see the value. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in when you guys did Scrum and what made you decide that it wasn't working. Because I'm in that world. Okay. It yeah. It doesn't work for me, but I'm wondering how. The rest of the team decided it was working for them. Yeah, so when we were doing that very first experiment, everybody is scrum. So we, even the US people had to say, oh, this thing's going to take me five story points, whatever, right? But the thing is, we all know about UX is that it's a continuous process about learning about your users or the market or the problem you're trying to solve. So a lot of times we'll learn something new. And we'll like come back and go, hey, guess what? The scope is actually way bigger. So even though I said that was five story points, it's actually now 10. So that keeps happening. Additionally, we also have uh, stakeholders, and we have we were relying on test results. And sometimes you can't, you just can't schedule, you know, ten user tests within two days. It's spread out. Because of that, we can't say, oh, we can get all this done within, you know, five story points. But it, so it just didn't make sense for us anymore. Like it's really confining us, and it's making us seriously feeling like low morale because we can't get it done within the time. So uh, so we just figure out, okay. UX is a repeat, repeated process. There's like you know you do this first, and this stuff. You do research, and then you do design, you do iteration. You, it's a it's a step process. You can actually move a car down that and then back again. And depending on the type of project it is, maybe something we skip a step or something. That made way more sense to us. So we switch over to that world, and it's proven to be way better um, in terms of getting our stuff done. It allowed time for the the unknown, I guess, with Kanban. Yeah. Yes? Um, as a UX researcher, I'm really interested in what you have to say about uh, working in a scrum environment. What's the most useful tools or methods or tests that you do, or that you have your UX researcher do to get out in a sprint, um, to get through kind of a, a development of a feature or a, a new application or something like that? What, what is the, I'm sorry, what? What are the most useful tools or methodologies that your you employ your UX researcher to do to help out in the kind of scrum methodology. We uh, I think we without knowing it I think we're doing lean UX. Um, and the UX researcher, let's see, the UX researcher doesn't actually interface with the engineers very much. With the, who the interface is actually the designers mostly, the users and product people, because their job is actually to help us get better at research. Because every single one of us does research there. So designers, we do research before the researcher showed up. The product owners, they, they're researching all the time. They're talking to the customers all the time. Same with the customer success people. They're always talking to customers to bring, bring back data. So our researchers were a little bit different in that their job is actually to help um, us to do even better research than we're already doing and collecting data systematically in a way that we can actually um, collect the data and put it in a database to easily tease out the patterns. So her job is a little bit different. I don't know if I'm answering you at all. <laughs> uh, to a point, um, I was, so like I do like user tests and that's pretty much like our bread and butter for things that we roll out. Mm -hmm. But because we're rolling out things so fast, it's hard to get five to 10 user tests in a, a sprint cycle. Yeah. So I'm looking for other ways that I can provide value without just banking on user tests every every feature or every... Yeah, so we have a guideline on what things to test, what things not to test. So if something that's using the same kind of pattern, existing pattern, we don't really test it. We maybe grab one or two people within the company who are closest to being a customer, have them look at it and call it good, 
and then we have, and if it's like a brand new kind of feature or a brand new pattern that we're using, we will like built in time and way ahead of time to say, all right, we think these end will probably get done in about four weeks from now. So we start, that's when we start recruiting a whole bunch of people and try to get it done within two or three days, if possible. But because, you know, we're working in enterprise data storage, we're actually, the stuff that we deal with, it may seem like really easy, like, oh, just a couple lines on the graph, the bar going up and down, it's actually super difficult. Because if you think about it, that data needs to be stored on the customer's storage advice. Right? We're taking up their storage. And we have to access it somehow, right? It's actually really, really difficult. So we, we stagger it. So sometimes we may be working on designing on this feature, but the engineer is only is working on like a feature we like designed six months ago. So during this time, we have plenty of time to do our test and iteration. So our world is a little bit differently because it's enterprise data storage it gives a little bit more time to do that kind of testing. <coughs> yeah. Um, could you provide a little bit more detail on how you mentioned that you delay defining specifications specifically around um, you? You define an MVP and an MLP, and then you get to the specifications part. And you kind of alluded to this place where you were with you kind of the UX design and the product owner part is very waterfall like all the research. You kind of have to bundle it up and you throw it over the wall, but you're at least interacting with the people and hoping that they build it the way that you do. But how long between the time that you define MVP and the time that you spec do you, how long is that? And then if you find out it's no longer relevant, what do you do? So um, it, it, it could be it could be that that time between step two and three could be one day could be over a year. Okay. And sometimes when we do open it up on, on a giant project like that, like oh hey, it's been a year, we're about to work on it. Um, we think the engineering team might have time to work on it in the, within the next two or three sprint. That's when we open it up. We're like okay, let's open it up. Let's take a look at it. Let's go talk with the engineers to see if they built something that supports the UX or not. And then that's when we start like making tweaks to it. Usually it's not a giant major change because we've done a really good job up front to figure out what problem we're trying to solve, what the pain points are. So whether they change the technology a certain way or not, it doesn't change how you're trying to solve the problem, the experience of it. It doesn't change it. It might be a little tweaks of here and there. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? I actually do have one more question. Sure. <laughs> so the concept of two backlogs is also really interesting to me. And I wondered, so you talked about, um, you know that like a UX designer has a very specific skill and a UI front end developer has a very specific skill. So if by chance the product owner doesn't prioritize any of your UX stories, what do you do during the sprint? Or does that never happen? That has never happened. Okay. He, he actually, I, I actually own the UX backlog, but he helps me prioritize it. So what I do, what I do is I prioritize the UX stuff, and I'll like advocate to him. I say, hey, we really need to do, you know, this thing on the top of the backlog compared to the thing you want to do. Let's get all three of them, like all two of them, done. Like I will advocate for that. Ultimately, it is him saying yes or no. Yes, you work on this, or no, you don't work on this. Ultimately, it's up to him. But we're because we're friends, we talk all the time. He gets me, I get him. You know. We kind of balance it out. I've never had a big fight. <laughs> and what was your biggest driver of, of making your UX work be in a sprint backlog and not just, I know I have these fights to do and that's Transparency, visibility, and kind of just give uh, people a heads up like what might be coming. Because people like to know, they want to be involved. I think the worst thing is when somebody's surprised by a design solution. That's the worst thing. Like. Even if you've done all the research, you know that you've done all these iterations and it's tested so well with the, with, the, with the customers and the users, you put it in front of somebody who's a stakeholder who's not involved, they're going to give you their visceral reaction or just want to cock block it because they weren't involved. Right? Don't ever surprise anybody. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.